Okay, folks, it's time and I want to get started. Any questions before we start? Okay, so I've got the recording going. I'm all set. Uh, today we're going to do the closing stretch here where we're going to talk about value enhancement. We've kind of set the table for this, right? To change the value of a firm, as I said last session, you've got to increase your cash flows and increase your value from growth, which might mean either cutting growth or increasing growth, depending on whether you're in a good business or bad business. It could be reducing your cost of capital or building up your competitive advantages. So you've got the tools. I'm going to play a game with you. I'm going to offer you a company and I'm going to ask... I'm sorry, I might have lost you there. I'm going to give you a company and ask you to see whether you can change the way this company is run. So the first company I'm going to offer you is a German software company called SAP. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to present my discounted cash flow valuation of this company. And as I present it, rather than get focused on the details, here's the question I want you to ask, answer. If you were running the company, what would you do differently from what I'm describing this company doing? So my initial valuation is with the company as is. I'm going to value the company with the existing management. I'm going to reflect what the, what the management does. And then I'm going to ask you, would you do something differently? No. So let me go through my valuation. This is, as I said, a German software company. It's reinvesting, it's, it's making money. Right now it's generating about 1.4 billion euros in operating income. So right now being whenever I did this valuation. It's free cash flow is about 602 million. It's reinvesting about 57% of its after-tax operating income back into the business. Am I still frozen, folks? Am I back? Okay. So it's reinvesting about 57% back. It's generating a return on capital of close to 20% of these investments. So it's reinvesting back about 57%. It's making about a 20% return on capital. If you take the product of the reinvestment rate times return on capital, it's growing at about 11.4% here, at least based on my expectations. So it's a money-making company. It's reinvesting about 57%, taking pretty good projects and earning 11.4%. Incidentally, it is very heavily, in, you know, it's grow, its markets are right now mostly Europe and North America. It's really not gone into Asia much. File that away because that might come into what you decide to do with the company. So I give it 11.4% growth for the next five years and then I scale the growth down to my risk free rate, 3.4%. Now, this company is also funded almost entirely with equity 99% equity, 1% debt. Why? Because the management is very conservative. They don't like to borrow money. That gives them a cost of capital of 8.68%. So I value the company with this growth rate and this cost of capital. The value that I get per share with the existing management running the company is about 106 euros per share. Are you with me so far? So this is with the existing management. So I'm going to pick on somebody in the class and make you pick. So Bill, you're going to be my guinea pig. Unmute yourself. Yeah? Uh, or I'll unmute you. Okay. So Bill, if you were running this company, yeah, I... what, what might you change in this company? It seems to be growing fast. It seems to be doing, taking good investments. And it's, is there anything you would change in the way this company's run? Um, probably lo lower uh, cost of capital. And do, by doing what? What's, what's the most obvious thing that jumps out at you? They're making a lot of money. They're 99% equity, 1% debt, right? You say maybe they could use yep. a little more debt. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. The other reason on the growth, I said much of their growth so far has come from North America and the US. Maybe they can reinvest a little bit more in Asia and the emerging markets, even if it means a lower return on capital. Okay, so let's take that. We don't know whether that's feasible. Let's see what would happen to SAP if I change the debt ratio. So here's what I did. I can't just automatically assume that borrowing more money is good for me because I have no idea what will happen to my cost of capital as I borrow more money. So here's what I did first. I looked at what the cost of capital for SAP would be at different debt ratios. Remember how I did this for Hormel? As my debt ratio goes up, I lever my beta. My cost of equity goes up. 
As my debt ratio goes up, my cost of debt will also go up because I become a riskier company. And in the last, second to last column, I have the cost of capital. And you see that at a 30% debt ratio, the cost of capital is going to be much lower than it is today. So I have some ammunition now, right? In addition to saying that they could borrow more money, I said maybe they should go to a 70% equity, 30% debt. That'll give them a lower cost of capital. That's going to be my biggest changer because here's what I did. I changed the debt ratio from what it is today, 70% from almost 99% equity to 70% 70 equity. My cost of capital goes down and that's my first change in the company. The second is I assume they would reinvest more in emerging markets. That pushes up the real... I probably froze again. Sorry about that. My, my Wi-Fi is acting up. So I give them a higher growth and a lower cost of capital, changing the debt ratio, reinvesting more. I revalue the company. I come up with 126 euros per share. Do you remember what the status quo value was? If we go back two pages, the status quo value was 106 euros. With the changes put in, the value that I get is 127 euros. What's the value of control at SAP? It's a difference between those two numbers. It's about 21 euros per share. And where is the value coming from? From the fact that I think the company can be run differently, run better. There's not a whole lot of change I'm putting at SAP because it's already a well-managed, well-run firm. So the value of control tends to be limited. But you see what I'm trying to do is look at a company and say, what can I do differently in this company? Any questions on SAP? But they, you know, you said, the change in the debt ratio is financial engineering. So what? If it increases value, it's still increasing value, right? It is true that it's from society's perspective, from the perspective of an entire economy, if this is the only way you create values by changing debt ratios, it's not a great way for an economy to operate because you're transferring wealth from taxpayers to companies. But if you're running a company, there's nothing immoral or unethical about doing financial engineering if you're doing it for the right reasons, which is you want your stockholders to pay less in taxes and derive a higher value. So I, you're right, it is changing. I mean, I, I won't even call it financial. You're recapitalizing the firm because it can afford to carry more debt. The value creation there is really a value transfer from taxpayers. But your job as CEO or the management SAP is to deliver the highest value you can. Any other questions on the SAP example? Okay, so I'm going to give you a second company. Since you were so good at fixing the first company, here's my second company. It's Blockbuster. Blockbuster in 2004. For those of you who don't know the history of Blockbuster, Blockbuster used to have a bunch of video rental stores. Most of you are prob probably too young to have gone into a Blockbuster store, but that's how you watch videos 30 years ago. You went into a Blockbuster store and you rented a video. And Blockbuster was an incredibly successful company for about 15 years because what they did was they bought individual video rental businesses, they rolled them all up and they made them into this big publicly traded company. So that's the company, 1997, 98, successful company. But then two things happened that destroyed Blockbuster's business. The first was the Netflix showed up for the first time. And Netflix, when it first showed up, actually used to mail you videos, because that's the original Netflix model, at a fraction of a cost that Blockbuster charged, and they had no late fees. That was one big advantage. The second was Walmart started setting up these rental booths where you could go rent a video for a dollar. So those two ways of delivering the business devastated Blockbuster. So what started happening, fewer and fewer people became Blockbuster members. Fewer and fewer people were showing up at the video stores. But here was the problem. Blockbuster did not seem to notice that their business model was breaking down. So you know what they continued to do? They continued to open more stores, even though nobody was coming to their stores. You see, that's insane. But companies often do that. They do what used to work. So now you're looking at Blockbuster, not in their glory days, but on their way down. Here's what they look like. They were still making money, 163 million, and they were still reinvesting money, opening new stores. The only problem was the return on capital they were making on their new stores was down to 4%. Saying, is that a problem? Yeah, the cost of capital was 6.17%. I've kind of made your job easy now. If you're going to come in to fix a company, they're growing, but they're growing by taking opening terrible investments, terrible stores. 
I value the company with the status quo. What does the status quo look like? Managers in denial. They keep opening stores even though nobody's coming into the stores. And the value that I got for Blockbuster per share, assuming they continue to grow by doing the stupid thing of reinvesting in bad businesses and continuing to do that in perpetuity, was about $5.13 per share. So, Ananya, I'm going to make you the new CEO of Blockbuster. So you come on in, what's the first thing you're going to do? You want to try it on you? I'm going to unmute you. Oh, Lucas, go ahead. You can you can step in. What would you, What's the first thing you would do? Uh, I guess I'll start closing down stores. I want to or before you even start closing down stores, at least stop opening new stores, right? Because getting out of existing stores might be more difficult. Why? Because you have five-year leases, seven-year leases, and shutting the store down might not make you the money back. So at the minimum, stop opening stores. Or if you're going to open stores, what's the minimum you should require these stores to make? Lucas, you still there? Um, I guess... I guess, you know, make back the investment, I guess, you know. Or insurance. the cost, at least make the cost of capital, right? Is that asking for too much? Zero net present value projects? So here's the thing I did. I revalued Blockbuster with a very simple change. I said, stop taking bad investments. At least take zero net present value, which is essentially the equivalent of saying, don't open stores if they don't make your cost of capital. With that one change put in, nothing else fixed. The value that I get is 1247. Think about it. With the status quo, it's 513. Run at least with good sets, not even with great business models. It's 1247. Dave mentioned try to get acquired, but if you're in a bad business, who's going to pay you a big price? The problem here is your business has turned bad, and the only way you can adapt to it is either by shrinking or shut or reducing stores, or by at least not trying to grow by taking bad investments. Look at how much my value changed as I went from the status quo to the optimal. It almost went up 150%. You're saying, why did it go up so much here and not as much with the SAP? The answer is very simple. SAP to begin with was a well-managed company. It might have had conservative managers, but they were good managers. But if you look at Blockbuster, Blockbuster is a terribly managed company. Fixing it can create a much greater increase in value. So here's the bottom line. When you think about the value of control, the value of control comes from the fact that you think you can run the firm differently than the existing management. It comes from that difference. But to get an expected value of control, you also have to assess what the chance is that you can change the management of the company. You say, what does that mean? Let's say you're in a company where the existing managers are entrenched. How? They're voting shares or they're family controlled. You can see the company is badly managed and badly run, but there's zero chance of you changing the way the company is run. Maybe the company has takeover restrictions. Maybe it has access, you're, you might not have the access to capital to change the firms. All of those things play into the probability that you can change the management. So when you look at a company, not only can you value the company twice, you also have to ask the follow-up question of, will this company have, can I change the management of the company? So, it's, uh, so the two examples, SAP and Blockbuster, you can also already see how different the value control can be for two companies. And at the, at the limit, if you have a company that's already perfectly managed and perfectly run, guess what happens to the difference? It goes to zero. The expected value of control is zero. So any, any questions on this? Um, Pablo, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Because I have a tough time keeping track of the chat and the question. So if you have... Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, can you hear? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So when Blockbuster was restructured in the last slide, mm -hmm. they said that it would have a return on capital of 6.2%. Mm -hmm. You're saying, how is that going to be possible yeah. in a bad business? Let's say it's not. You know what I would do? I'd make the reinvestment rate zero. Uh -huh. It'll give exactly the same value because when you grow and you earn the cost of capital, that growth has no value. So I could very easily make this zero percent. My value per share would still be about twelve fifty. And then the money they would give to stockholders to dividends, or, or instead or of exactly, investing, or, or buy shares back, or just make your company smaller. Nobody's coming into your stores. What the heck are you doing wrong? 
Yeah. All right. Thank you. Dave? Uh, what actually ended up happening to the blockbuster? Okay, that's actually an interesting story. A guy called Carl Icahn. You might have heard of him. Targeted blockbuster. Now what he targeted them with? He said, stop growing. Give me the cash back. And he actually managed to, he, he was able to get enough shareholders on his side and you can see why. Everybody could see what they were doing wasn't working. But you needed a call I can to get the process rolling. So when I talk about the probability that you can change management, overnight, I'm going to show you what happened the day Carl I can announced he was targeting Blockbuster to its stock price. And you can very quickly see why the stock price reacted when he came in. Tim? Yes, uh, so when you factor in the probability that you can change the management, are you assuming that management isn't necessarily stupid, but they're doing this on purpose? So meaning yeah. that like, they're, they're, they're not perfectly managing this company on purpose? Just, yeah, it's a... The question is, you know, you got to give me a motive, right? So if they're doing it on purpose, what is their intent? Are they getting side benefits from this? Maybe every time they open a store, they get a kickback? I need to read the, read the rest of the story. It's possible that they've, you know, that they've set up these side agreements where they get richer while the company gets poorer. Most of the time in U.S. companies, that's not the case. It's just that they do stupid things simply because they don't know any better. They're doing what used to work. It's no longer working, but they're not noticing. So I am assuming that the, property, that the reason you need a push here is somebody has to come in and push for change. Because if, it, if you don't push for change, sometimes the same stupid things can keep happening year after year until the company gets run into the ground. So let's talk a little bit about what drives the probability of management changing. As you think about the probability of management changing, it can change over time. Why? Because corporate governance rules can change, activist investors can come and go. And the threat of a hostile acquisition, even if it's in a different company in the same business, can increase the probability of change. Let me explain. You have a badly managed steel company. Let's say it's a U.S. steel company. And another U.S. steel company that's badly managed gets targeted in a hostile takeover. You know what? The instant that happens, the probability of change in your company also jumps. Why? Because your managers get scared when they see that takeover happen. So when you think about the probability of management changing, it's not going to be a fixed number. It is going to change over time. Which means that when you sit down to value the expected value of control in a company, you're trying to assess this probability of change. So here are some things you might want to look at that have come out of looking at U.S. companies that have been where management has changed. One is companies where the stock price has done badly and earnings have underperformed relative to the peer group are more likely to see change than companies where stock prices are up and earnings have done well. Common sense, but the more the worse a company does, the greater the chance of change. The second is Companies where the board of directors is small and composed mostly of outsiders, you're more likely to see change than when you have large boards of directors with lots of insiders. Again, common sense corporate governance. Third, companies where you have high institutional holdings, you're more likely to see change than when you have low institutional holdings. Not because institutional investors are smarter, but they're more likely then to get a coalition going to push for change. And finally, Change seems to be more likely in some sectors than others. Don't ask me why, but change, my, you often see you know, change ebb and flow, where in a particular sector, you see a lot of management changes happen kind of bunched together. Because when one company sees change, other companies also see increased change. So I'm not saying that any of these will give you a precise answer, but you're essentially looking for some way of assessing, is there a chance of change in my company? So I'm going to use four different places where this tool of expected value control is going to allow me to come up with values for companies or values for things that I otherwise might have just thrown up my hands on. First, I'm going to argue that in hostile acquisitions, this gives me a way of valuing control. Remember we talked about control premiums where people pay 20%? I'm going to give you a much better way of estimating control premiums where you value the company twice, status quo and optimal. With publicly traded companies, I'm going to argue that what you observe as a stock price reflects an expected value of control. Why? Because markets assess, is there a chance management to change and they build it into the stock price. And we'll talk about how you can back out that probability of change. 
Third, I'm going to use this expected value of control to talk about why voting shares should have a premium over non-voting shares, what drives the size of that premium and when that premium might disappear. When you value Google or Facebook, you're going to run into this scenario because you're voting and non-voting shares. Now, how much of a premium or a discount should I attach to non-voting shares? Fourthly, when you have private businesses, you own a private business, and you're not trying to sell the entire business, you're trying to sell a portion of the business. There's a big difference between trying to sell 49% of a private business and 51%. Why? Because when you sell 51%, the person buying the 51% gets control of the business. With 49%, you don't get control. So what happens in private company valuations is there's something called a minority discount when you try to sell 49% or 45% or 40%. We're going to talk about how much that discount should be using the expected value of control. So you ready? Let's start with a hostile acquisition. At the time that I valued Blockbuster, remember I showed you the two values? Blockbuster was trading at about $9.50 per share. It wasn't trading at the low value that you saw as a status quo value. It wasn't trading at the high value that I got with the value of control, $9.50. Let's say you're a hostile acquirer of Blockbuster. Potentially, you could pay up to $12.47, right? Because a company is worth more if it's fixed. And this is something we talked about in the context of M&A as well. Would you pay the entire $2.97? That, that's the difference between $12.47 and $9.50 as a premium on this acquisition? Anybody? Would you pay the entire $2.97? Dave? Uh, no, because if you did, then you wouldn't be, it would be an NPV zero type of... Exactly. So you want to negotiate for a share of that 297, right? And that's something that I think a lot of people forget when there's, even when there's control value. Value and control is only the first part. You still have to negotiate for a share. And in fact, let me ask you a follow-up question. Let's assume it will take you three years to put the changes in. You remember that you've got to kind of fix the investment policy. Let's say it will take you three years to shut down bad stores, try to get your stores kind of rationalized. How would that affect how much you'd be willing to pay? First, let me ask you the easy question. It's two ninety seven. assuming you could do it right away. It will take you three years to implement the change. Will you pay? Will it be worth less or more? Then you, since your mic is on, will you know what it would be worth less or more? Well, over three years, it'll be worth less because of the cost of capital. And you discount back the two ninety seven at your cost of capital. You'd come up with maybe two thirty or two forty. So, if you want to pay for control in an acquisition, not only do you have to value control, but you also have to ask a follow up question: How long will it take me to change this company? It will take you eight or nine or ten years you might have to discount that chain, that control value by nine or 10 years to get to what you'd be willing to pay today. So in hostile acquisitions, and you're talking about control premiums, you now have a tool for estimating how much that control premium should be. Any questions on this example? But Dave, when you say the difference is really small, what difference is really small? $2.97? No, the two dollars thirty cents is only a twenty percent premium on the nine dollar fifty cents. And what do you say? Um, only, why do you say? Why do you say only twenty percent? You act like twenty percent is noise. Would you be happy if your company could increase its value twenty percent? I would, but it's not guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed. No, but but remember, you already adjusted for the risk in your discount rate. So this is a risk adjusted change in value. You know what? I I'm with you. I'd rather have a fifty percent increase in value but I'll take 20% over 5%. So, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's a side issue, but when you think about large or small, you got to think about the fact that the average portfolio manager makes 1.5% less than the market. If you can create value, even if it's 10%, what does the average acquisition do? It destroys value. If you can create even 10%, I'll take it as a plus. So you're right, it's a small number, but it's still not an, ins if it were 3%, I'd be with you, but 20% I think is big enough that I'm gonna work at getting it. Because especially in a large company, this could be billions of dollars in added value. Now let's take a second, a second example. Let's suppose you're looking at, a, at Blockbuster as a publicly traded company. Let's say there's no hostile acquisition. 
Remember I told you the stock price was 950? You say, well, why would it be 950 if the status quo value is $5.13? You know what the market's job is to assess what the expected value of a stock is based on not just the existing management, but the likelihood of change. So let's suppose I ask you a question. I said, look, take my two values, $5.13 in 1247 as pretty good estimates of status quo and optimal. Take the market price. Can you estimate the probability of change at the company? Well, you can, right? Basically, all you have to solve is the probability number. And that number was 59.5% when I did this analysis. The market was assess assessing a 59.5% chance of change given what the market price was. I did this right after Carl Icahn targeted Blockbuster. So I went back to the pre, you know, before he showed up, the price was 820. If you take the price of 820 and back out the property of change, it was 42%. Saying what changed? Carl Icahn showed up. The minute he showed up, it's not that the status quo and the optimal value changed, but the probability of change jumped almost 20%. Now do you see why you're the stockholder in a badly managed company? It is good for you when a Carl Icahn takes a position in your company. If nothing else, what has it done? It's increased the likelihood of change in your company. It doesn't even have to come from outside. Sometimes all it has to do is take the existing management, prod them into changing. Do you know that Carl Icahn increased his position in Occidental a couple of weeks ago? And right after he did this, Occidental announced a series of changes they were going to make as a company, which, they were, which were long overdue. So when you see the market price of a publicly traded company embedded in that market price is a probability of change and that probability can change when an activist investor pops up. Any questions on how you can back out the probability of change? So if you can get a status quo and optimal value for your company by looking at the market price, you can assess a probability of change in your company. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yes. So if, if you think the activist investor might actually decrease value, yeah. can you do the same? You could do the same, thing. Do the same thing. You could do the same thing. That would be very perverse and sometimes it happens. I sometimes look at an activist investor and what he's suggesting is that that would be terrible. You could do exactly the same thing. Because there are some stupid activist investors. I've, I've seen some announcements made and the, and the, the plans they have and they said this isn't going to work. You could do exactly the same thing. Which brings me to, so basically when you think about the value per share, that's, you know, and I'm going to use that as my platform to talk about how voting shares and non-voting shares can be valued. So if you have only one class of shares, you do what I just did. You take the status quo value, you take the probability of change times the expected change in value, and you divide by the total number of shares outstanding. So if you ask me to value the probability of uh, 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 value a share in, um, in Apple, I could value Apple status quo, value Apple optimal, and take the expected value and divide by the total number of shares outstanding. But let's say you ask me to do this in a company of voting and non-voting shares. Saying, so what if you're voting and non-voting shares? I'm going to make a leap of faith. I'm going to argue that if there's an expected value of control, it goes to the voting shareholders. That's the benefit you get from voting, is you get a vote in who runs a company. But if you have a non-voting share, guess what you get? You're stuck with the status quo value. So here's how I'm going to value non-voting and non-voting shares. I'm first going to do a status quo value of your company, and then I'm going to do an optimal value, just as I did for SAP and Blockbuster. Then I'm going to take the status quo value and divide it by the total number of shares outstanding, voting plus non-voting, and I'm going to argue that my value per non-voting share is stuck at the status quo value. And then I'm going to take the expected value of control and pay it as a premium on my voting shares. I know it sounds incredibly abstract, but let me give you a very simple example. A few years ago, maybe 15 years ago, I valued Embraer, the Brazilian aerospace company, with voting and non-voting shares. In Brazil, they're called common and preferred shares. I came up with a status quo value of 12.5 billion for Embraer. I revalued the company with changes put in. I thought the company had some weak spots and I said, if I fix those, I came up with a value of 14.7 billion. So my status quo value is 12.5, my optimal value is 14.7 billion. I estimated only a 20% chance of change. Why? Because the company is run by insiders. It's going to be very difficult, not impossible, very difficult to change. 
So if you think about the $2.2 billion difference, there's only a 20% chance that that difference will actually be accomplished. So you ready? Here's what I have. I have 477 million non-voting shares, 242.5 million voting shares. To value the non-voting shares, I took my status quo value, 12.5 billion, and divided by the total number of shares outstanding, voting plus non-voting. I get a value per share of $17.38, or 17.38 reais per share. Then I took the 20% of the 2.2 billion, that's a change in value, and assume that only the voting shareholders benefit from that value. It's an extreme scenario, but I'm going to push it to the limit. I get that two, that extra 2.2 billion, but only among the voting shareholders. That gives me a value per voting share of 19.19. My voting shares will trade at a premium of 10.4%. That's a difference between 1919 and 1738. But think of where the premium comes from. It comes from the fact that I think Embraer is not perfectly well managed. And it comes from the fact that I think change can happen. Do you see where I'm going with this? Google has three classes of shares. Class A, which has all of the voting rights. Ten, ten times the voting rights of Class B. That's, those are the shares held by you know, the insiders in the company. That's Class B shares, which have only one voting right for every ten. On, and Class C shares, which have no voting rights at all. So if I ask you to value Class B shares versus Class A shares, how much of a premium do you think the voting shares would have in Google? Using the framework that I just talked about, do you think the premium will be big or small and what will drive that premium? Sebastian, I'll come back to you unless you want to address that question. You want to try? Okay, okay Sebastian, give it a shot. Do you think the, value, the, the voting share premium will be large or small at, at Google? It would be small. And why would it be small? Because a change of management goal doesn't provide much value add. And it's a well-managed company. If you have a well-managed company where yeah. the probability of change is low, the voting shares will, in fact, Google Class A and Class B shares trade at almost, Class A, in fact, all three classes of the shares trade at roughly the same price. And people are puzzled. They say, what's going on here? The answer is, here they come. In contrast, think about Viacom. Viacom is a disaster company now. It's got corporate governance issues, terribly managed. It's got voting and non-voting shares. What do, you th what do you think the premium will be for voting over non-voting shares? Given that I've set it up as a badly managed company, it's going to be huge. So when you look at voting and non-voting shares and you ask well, how much would the premium be, one of the questions you need to address is, is my company well managed and what is the chance of change in the company? If one or both of those numbers is zero, voting and non-voting shares will converge. If both those numbers are large, then you should expect to see voting shares trade at a much larger premium on non-voting shares. So Sebastian, I'm going to let you ask the other question because I don't think your question was directly related to this. What's your, what was the question or comment you had? Yeah, I was just going to ask if um, the fact that there are different prices for voting and non-voting uh, shares wouldn't this be like a free lunch for the non-voting shareholders, considering that they can free ride in the change of yeah. management? It depends on how the change of management happens. I'll, I'll give you a personal horror story to reflect what can happen if you own non-voting shares. This was about 16, 17 years ago. I was a shareholder in Embev. Embev is the Brazilian beverage company. And I had preferred shares. Why? Because those are the only shares I could buy in Embev. So I own preferred shares. And Embev was targeted by, for an acquisition by a Belgian brewer called Imbev. Very confusing. Imbev buys Embev. But, so I was expecting a big payoff because usually when you're a target company shareholder, there's an acquisition. Remember that premium I was expecting? 20% premium, 25%. You know what my premium was? 2%. You know why it was so low? Because Imbev actually paid a 45% premium to the common, the voting shareholders, to acquire the company and then paid a 2% premium to the non-voting shareholders. So I don't disagree with you that there is a chance of free riding on the voting shareholders, but you gotta be very careful because there can be deals where the voting shareholders can negotiate for a disproportionately large share of the spoils, depending on how the deal is structured. Brazil actually allowed what were called two-tier offers, which basically means you can offer two different prices if you're an acquirer for two classes of shares, 
And after that happened, the difference between voting and non the difference between voting and non voting shares in Brazil widened. So you have a good point, but I think you've got to be very careful if you're a non voting shareholder. Did I freeze up, guys? Sebastian, did I answer your question? Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Now let's apply this to a private company. Remember when we value? You no, know, I don't think we value Christmas. But let's say you know you're valuing a private company. It's a candy company, and you value it at 1.6 million with the existing management in place. And let's say you come up with two million as the optimal value for the equity. Let's say I offer you 51 percent of this company. What's the most you'd be willing to pay for the company? This isn't it what you'd pay, but what's the most you'd be willing to pay for if I offer you 51%? You'd pay 51% of the optimal value, right? Because you get to run the company. But if I offer you 49% of the same company, guess what? You'd be paying me 49% of the status quo value. That 2% difference translates into almost a 30% difference in what you're willing to pay. You see, that doesn't sound right. It, it makes absolute sense. I mean, I given the example of the New York Knicks as a badly run franchise. If, and I'll, I'll be quite honest, if you offered me a piece of the New York Knicks, you know, first question I'm gonna ask you, is Dolan still going to run the team? If the answer is yes, what I will offer you as value is much lower than if you told me you'd give me complete control. This is exactly, any Mets fans in this class? No Mets fans? Come on, somebody must be a Mets fan. So no Mets fans, you know. But uh, even if you're not a Mets fan, do you, did you read the story about six months ago that Steve Cohen, Steve Cohen is this well-known hedge fund manager, had agreed to buy the, the Mets. They mentioned the price, like a billion plus, but that deal fell through. Does anybody know why the deal fell through? The deal fell through because the Wilpons, who've run the Mets terribly for the last, I don't know, two decades, wanted to stay on running the firm after they'd sold Steve Cohen a controlling stake. So you know what Steve Cohen said? I'm walking away. If I'm buying the Mets because I think I can fix this team, but as long as you guys run the team, that's never going to happen. That is a perfect example of how getting a majority stake in control and changing the way a company is run can give you a chance to pay much more for the same business. So four scenarios, hostile acquisitions, market price of a regular publicly traded company, voting and non-voting shares, and a minority stake in a private business. And you can see the expected value of control play out. Any questions on the expected value of control? I have a question. Go ahead. But this is actually back in, when we were talking about blockbusters, yep. do you have let, any... Let, let me go back to the blockbusters. So, go, so talk do about... You have, do, you have any, do you have any examples or a story about a company that successfully uh, shrunk in size? Yeah. Because I think practically... I'll give you my point. If you get a chance, remember I put up a value... I know I've been throwing a lot of stuff at you, but about two weeks ago, I put up a valuation of Severstal. Severstal is a Russian steel company. And what, Sever, what attracted me to Severstal was the fact that they actually shrunk their revenues by 50%. They, they actually became half the size of the company they used to be. You know why they did it? Because the steel business outside Russia imploded. So what Severstal did was they shut down their businesses outside Russia and they shrunk back to becoming this really profitable Russian steel company. I bought Severstal shares after I, after I did the story and valuation. That to me is a perfect example of a company that responds to the world around them. But you know why Severstal did that? Because the, the CEO of the company actually is the largest shareholder of the company. For him, this wasn't other people's money. He said, why am I throwing money into a bad business? Let me go back to the part of the world where I make money. So if you get a chance, visit the Severstal valuation because it's fascinating how a company can get smaller and become more valuable at the same time. So he focused on bettering the margins instead of... Exactly. He went back to Russia because it turned out in, the, in Russia he had very little competition. So his margins were three times higher in Russia than the rest of the steel business. 
So he went back basically to his Russian business. He became a smaller Russia-focused company. Doesn't mean he won't go back to being global. If the steel business improves outside Russia, he leaves open the option to expand again. But for the moment, he said, I'm going to get smaller, I'm going to get more focused, and I'm going to make money where I, where I can make money. And that's exactly where he went. He went back to Russia. Interesting. All right. Thanks. Any other questions on the value control? So let me go to the last piece of what I want to talk about. So we've talked about increasing value and there's no there's no genius to it. There are four levels. There's a cash flow level, there's a growth level, there's a cost of capital level, there's a comparative advantage level. But there are many CEOs who find this process too complicated. Don't ask me why. They said this DCF stuff, too complicated. And you know who takes advantage of this? Consultants. Consultants through time have offered magic bullets. You know what I mean by magic bullets? They say, if you do this, your value is going to go up. And consultants love inventing acronyms. So I'm going to talk about two acronyms you might or might not see in the consulting space. One is this concept called economic value added. Okay? I'm going to talk about how empty a concept this is and how widely it got bought into in the 1990s. It was concocted by this outfit called Stern Stewart that claimed that it was the answer to value enhancement. You adopted EVA, you're going to become this incredibly successful firm. I'm going to show you the definition of EVA and your first reaction is, what's the big deal here? And there's a second approach called CFROI. CFROI basically is a variant on EVA. So EVA, you look at the dollar difference in value between the returns you make and the returns you need to make. And I'll, I'll be more specific on that. CFROI is a percentage number. EVA was created by Stern Stewart. CFROI was created by an outfit called Holt Associates. It got bought by Morgan Stanley. But my point is consulting firms through time have said, DCF is too complicated, just focus on this instead. Increase growth. Go for more users. Increase your EVA, increase your CFROI. I, I understand the, the, the allure of picking something simple, but I'm gonna argue that by doing this, you run a risk. And I'm gonna use EVA as my example for the kind of risk you're going to run into if you focus on a shortcut, because these are all shortcuts. So here's, my, here's what EVA is. It's a difference between return on capital and cost of capital. Remember the return on investment capital we spend a lot of time in this class on? It's a difference between these two numbers divided by the capital invested in a project or a company. Invested capital, the, the denominator in your ROIC is basically the capital invested. So I take the difference between return on capital and cost of capital, which is a percentage, and I multiply by a dollar value. So as an example, if I'm a company making a 15% return on capital and my cost of capital is 10%, 15 minus 10 is 5%, I multiply the 5% by, let's say, the billion dollars in invested capital I have. You see, what does that give me? It gives me a dollar value of excess returns I created this year, which is 5% of a billion is 50 million. So here's what Stern Stewart went around telling people. It's better to have bigger EVA than smaller EVA. Big deal, of course. So I'd rather earn a bigger excess return on a larger amount of money. But for whatever reason, CEOs at companies thought this was amazing. They said, this is amazing. We never even realized this would work for us. So in the 1990s, EVA became perhaps the most widely adopted measure among the S&P 500 companies. CFROI was adopted, as I said, by Holt Associates. It's more like IRR. So the way to think about EVA is EVA is closer in spirit to NPV. If you think about NPV of projects, CFROI is like an internal rate of return. And Holt Associates said companies should have high IRR, high CFROI. Can you say, why do I need a consultant to come in and tell me this? Something, sometimes I think CEOs need to be reminded of basic stuff and they need to pay a lot of money to be reminded and the consultants fill the, fill the void. The bottom line though is if you value a company based upon EVA, the value that you get for the company will be exactly the same as doing a traditional discounted cash flow valuation. And I'm going to prove this with a very simple example. But basically, I'm pushing back against this notion that you can get better valuations of companies if you use EVA or CFR or ROI, which is what the consultants were claiming. And if there are differences in value coming from the two approaches, it's because you're making different assumptions. 
So I'm going to take a very simple example to illustrate how using these approaches will give you roughly the same value. Let's say you have a firm with a book value of 100 million. So that's a capital investment in the firm. It expects to generate a 15% return on capital on this book value in perpetuity. So 15% a year, every year in perpetuity with a cost of capital of 10%. So it's basically making 5% more than its cost of capital on the 100 million. It's not quite done yet. It can make additional investments of 10 million every year for the next five years. And on these investments, these new investments, it's going to continue to make a 15% return on capital with a cost of capital of 10%. So on the new investments, it's going to continue to make a 5% excess return. After year five, its project stream dries up. So whatever it invests after year five, it will continue to grow, but it's going to earn the cost of capital. So it has existing investments of 100 million on which it's going to make a 15% return forever. It's going to make new investments for the next five years, which are also going to be good investments, earning more than the cost of capital. But after year five, there are no more new investments. I'm going to value this company in two ways. I'm going to value it with a traditional DCF, and then I'm going to value it based on this EVA approach. Let's see if the two approaches give you different answers. Let's first try the EVA approach. Here's how you value a company with EVA. Stern Stewart spent a lot of money convincing people that this was the right way to do things. They said, start with the capital invested in place. That's 100 million. Take the present value of the excess returns you will make on that capital. Remember, you're making 5 million every year in perpetuity. 5 million every year in perpetuity. The present value of use the 10% cost of capital is an extra 50 million. So 100 is the capital invested. 50 million is the value created by the excess returns you make on existing assets. Then I counted in the present value of investment. Remember, they can continue to make investments. That's the present value of new investments in year one, year two, year three. And basically, for the next five years, I add to my value. My total value, if I sum those all up, is 170.85 million. So basically, I'm valuing the company as capital invested plus the present value of excess returns are going to make in the future. So I get a value of 170.85 million. 70.85 million reflects the present value of excess returns. So I'm stern to it. I'm telling you, this is amazing. This will give you a much more precise value than you'd have got with the DCF model. Really? Let me try a DCF valuation of the same company. So in this case, I'm just doing traditional DCF. Remember in a traditional DCF, I start with after-tax operating income and I subtract out net capex. So 10 million is my net capex every year for the next five years. My after-tax operating income reflects a 15% return on capital. I subtract out the net capex, I come up with free cash flows of the firm for the next five years. After the fifth year, I put in a 5% growth rate. But remember, because I earn the return on capital on my new investments, the reinvestment I will need after year five is 50%, 5% divided by the 10% return on capital. So I've got my free cash flows, I've got my terminal value. I did a traditional DCF. What does that mean? I took the present value of the free cash flows of the firm plus the present value of the terminal value. The value that I got for the firm using traditional DCF was 170.85 million. Do you remember what it was with the EVA approach? 170.85 million. To the nth decimal point, I get the same value. Why? Because in a traditional DCF, here's what I'm doing differently. Rather than dividing my cash flows into the cash flow to cover my cost of capital and excess, I'm just taking the total amount. Dividing up the cash flow can't change your present value. There's nothing particularly new or different about EVA. It does have some interesting implications that I think some CEOs needed a reminder on. One is, it did show that growth by itself did not create value. Remember the company continues to grow after year five, but there is no value created. Why? Because it earns a cost of capital. It does show that companies that earn more than the cost of capital will trade at market values well above the cost of capital, but we knew, uh, well above the book value. But if you did traditional DCF, we knew this already. There was nothing that Stern Stewart was doing that was adding much to what we already knew. But for this service, as I said, at one point in time, half the companies in the S&P 500 were paying Stern Stewart to compute their EVA for them. And they actually went further. They actually set compensation for managers based on the EVA they created. An extraordinarily dangerous thing to do because now managers got focused on increasing EVA rather than increasing value. 
And one of the things to remember is when you judge management based on year-to-year -year EVA changes, I can increase EVA doing the right things, taking better projects, increasing my access returns. But here's how else I can increase EVA. I can do some really stupid things. In fact, I wrote an entire paper on all of the value destructive things I could do while increasing EVA. Like what? In those days, if you leased an asset, it wasn't counted as part of capital invested. But if you bought it, it was counted as capital invested. So it was a very easy way to increase your EVA. Instead of buying assets, just go lease them. Even if it cost you 50% more, your EVA would go up. You could increase EVA in the near term by giving up of growth in the future. By doing what? By taking higher return short term projects over better projects long term in terms of creating value but lower returns. I'm not trying to be perverse here, but I'm saying that if you judge management based on EVA, they're going to play three games. They're going to play the growth trade-off game by taking projects that deliver returns earlier rather than later. So short term is going to be measured, you know, valued more than the long term. They're going to play a risk game where they keep taking riskier and riskier business. They're entering the riskier and riskier businesses, hoping your cost of capital doesn't catch up with them. Or they're going to play the capital investor game. An example would be leasing something instead of buying it. Because you want to make the capital invested into as low a number as possible and you return on capital as high as possible. And company after company in the US, play, you saw managers play this game. Where Stearns do it now, thank God, they're dead and gone. But they lasted too long in my view. They sold a bill of goods to managers saying, this is the magic bullet. So the bottom line with EVA is the relationship between EVA and value change is a lot more complicated than Stearns who had let on. I can increase the EVA for a company while reducing value by doing some really stupid things. So my point is not to just dump and turn to it, but to say, look, if you see a shortcut at a consulting firm, and every consulting firm has its own shortcut for creating value, think through the consequences. Go back to basic DCFs because it will tell you what the weakest legs of using that shortcut are. Now, I've, uh, you know, in the 1990s, I was often asked to be, you know, asked to debate one of the EVA people because when Stern Stewart was out, when Stern Stewart was out there pushing EVA, a lot of CEOs said, is this really true? Is this better? And I would say no. And they said, why don't you come debate? And one of the people that Stern Stewart would send out to debate this concept was Joel Stern, one of the co-founders of Stern Stewart. And Joel was not, I'm sorry, it was, was Bennett Stewart, one of the co-founders. Joel Stern was the other. Bennett was an incredible salesperson. That's one reason Stern Stewart took off. And one of, the, one of the props he used to use, which used to drive me crazy, is he'd get in front of CEOs and he'd hold up an annual report for Coca-Cola. Remember, the, in 2003-2004, Coca-Cola was your ultimate successful company, a company that had been able to grow in spite of being a big company and had been able to deliver high returns and high value. He'd hold up an annual report to 100 CEOs of companies that were having trouble. So, do you want to be like Coca-Cola? And then he'd say, well, Coca-Cola uses EVA. And then he'd say, okay, if you want to be like Coca-Cola, you have to use EVA. This is like one of those logic classes you took in high school. Say so A leads to B, B leads, then A must lead to C. So after watching Bennett do this a dozen times with different audiences, I came up with my own props. I actually bought a pair of um, Air Jordans. You know, when Nike had first come out of the Air Jordans, and I, you know, I'd, I'd go into, into an audience and I'd hold up my Air Jordans and say, do you want to be like Michael Jordan? And everybody, of course, wanted to be like Michael Jordan. They wanted to be able to, you know, get three feet off the ground, slam dunk a ball. And he said, well, Michael Jordan wears, uh, you know, Air Jordans. He wears Nikes. You know? And then I'd say, and then I'd very, uh, then I'd stop talking. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd put the Nikes on. Say, can somebody point me towards a basketball hoop because I want to slam dunk a basketball. I'll tell you something about my jumping ability. I get up about 12 inches off the ground. There's no way. I'm, the only basketball hoops I can slam dunk on are Fisher Price. You know the kids ones? What I'm trying to say is I can wear the most expensive Air Jordans in the world, but I'm never going to slam dunk a ball. You could use EVA, but that was not the reason Coca-Cola was creating value. It was creating value because of an incredible competitive advantage. It was doing the right thing in terms of taking the right projects. Creating value is hard work. Adopting a symbol, a new measurement mechanism, and expecting your value to go up is asking for two. 
So when you think about focusing on year-to-year -year changes, you're going to see a lot of damage done when companies, high-growth companies, try to focus on, on trying to increase return on capital. Today, in fact, people have shifted away from EVA, but they're still too focused, in my view, on ROIC. This has become the magic word, not a consulting word. We have to increase ROIC. What the heck is ROIC? Return on invested capital. That's a very dangerous game you're playing. I can show you a dozen value-destructive ways in which you can increase ROIC. It's better. So when you think about companies where EVA does the most damage, high growth companies are more damaged by EVA than low growth companies. Companies where I can change the leverage and the risk profile of the company are damaged more by adopting EVA because I can play risk games. And companies where I can change the invested capital based on decisions I make or whether to lease or buy, much more dangerous to adopt EVA. So my bottom line is you cannot create value by picking one of these acronyms. So may, I know some of you are going to work, go work at the McKinsey's, the Bain's, the BCG's, the Deloitte's of the world. Every consulting firm has a magic bullet that they claim will create value, whether it's ROIC or EVA or CFROI. Whatever the mechanism, go back to basics. You cannot reinvent the wheel here. Ultimately, creating value is hard work. It means you've got to increase cash flows or get more value from growth. There's no magic way of doing it. So... Value enhancement is not difficult. It just requires that you bring together two skills. One is being able to value companies, and the other is understanding the drivers of value. And if you can bring those two skills together, you can do restructuring, you can be an activist investor, you can be a very... In fact, what separates good private equity firms from bad ones is good private equity firms are very good at managing businesses because it's not just investing. You've got to manage these businesses. The KKRs and Blackstones of the world have created their success by taking over badly managed companies, fixing them, and then flipping them back to the market as better managed companies. And hopefully this session has given you some of the ideas of how would you change a firm. So my suggestion is pick a firm that is in the news that's badly managed. Maybe pick a firm that a Carl Icahn has targeted, a company like Occidental, that play the game that we just played with both Blockbuster and SAP. What would I change in this company? Because those skills are going to be skills that you can draw on for the long term. So I'm going to stop there because we're done with the slides. Um, and reminder again, please, when you get a chance, you know, go in and enter your numbers into the Google Shared Spreadsheet. But we have about 15 minutes. So even if you want to log off and leave, you're welcome to. But you, you can ask me any questions. It doesn't have to be about value enhancement, about anything to do with valuation, your project, the exam. Yeah. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question about the project. So I saw that in the previous projects from the 2004, 2005, um, they always spent EVA. Yeah, you don't have to do that because you can see why. Because yeah, I just okay. dumped on EVA. There's really nothing that was that's, added that's, by that's doing this. Yeah. And I got sick and tired of people telling me what they'd already told me. So I said, why am I even asking people to do this? Okay. So no EVA needed. But if you want to wear a restructuring hat, you can do it. You know what I mean by restructuring hat? You've done a valuation of your company. Play, just play a game. Let's say if I ran this company, what would I do differently? It's an interesting what if. So if you want to do that, you're welcome to. It's not even part of this project. So if you don't want to do it before next Monday, you can wait and do it. But give it a shot because I think it's a, it's a very good skill set to have. So how would I change the value of a company? Okay. Yui? Oh, so Professor, since you mentioned how EVA and DCF generate the same value, so wasn't it like you talked about how managers push um, EVA value, isn't it the same as pushing the DCF value? Not if they're rewarded based on what happens in a year. If they push EVA value, I wouldn't have a problem, but that's not what Stearns to it did. They used the EVA value as their entry into the company, and then they said, we're going to set compensation based not on EVA value, but what happens on year-to-year -year EVA changes. Do you see I what see I'm saying? So, so yes. what they said was, if you can increase EVA next year, we're going to give you a bonus. That's where the danger comes in. Because if they said, we will give you a bonus if you increase the present value of your EVA over time, I would never have an issue with that. It's just a follow-up question. Could yeah. you mention, talk about the ROIC as well? Yeah. Bit? Same idea, right? If I max, if I focus on increasing ROIC next year. Could I do some really stupid things and increase my ROIC while destroying value? I could. 
I mean, I could, for instance, tell you to take short-term growth projects, even though it might destroy your long-term value. So if my focus becomes increasing ROIC, and I forget that ROIC is, piece, is a piece of a much bigger puzzle, I can increase the ROIC while reducing value. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Peter? Uh, Professor, I'll say Yeah, go ahead there. Divish, uh, what, what, what if you, I'm sorry, but um, so, uh, so yeah. like you mentioned us sometimes with some investments that a company makes won't show up as part of capital invested. Do you have exactly, like, what would be examples of times where you can invest in something and bump up our, um, ROIC but not Because if, up remember what, what went into your investment capital, when you did ROIC, what went into your invested capital? Book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash, right? So let's say you want to make your return yeah. invested capital shoot up. Here's a very simple suggestion. Take an old project and just write it off. Do you see how this changes the game? If I write off an old bad investment, what happens to my invested capital? Goes down. Goes down. My return invested capital goes up and I collect my bonus and I say, look, I created value for you. I've done nothing of the sort. I've just made your numbers look cosmetically better. So that's a very simple example. And I think a lot of accounting actions you see are not driven by giving information. It's because there's a lot of game playing going on in the background. So it might actually drive you to pay, do buybacks instead of dividends. Even though dividends might be better for your stockholders, why are buybacks better if you think in terms of return invested capital? Because when I do buybacks, the market value is higher than the book value. By buying back enough shares, I can make my book value of equity negative or zero. So that's just two examples, but the lease is actually a classic example. Until 2019, accountants didn't treat leases as debt. So you know what? I would never buy an asset. I would lease it every single time if I'm judged based on EBA. Even if it doesn't make sense for me to lease. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Makes sense, okay, thank yeah. you, Professor. Dave, go ahead. Um, so I two questions the first question is based off the question you just answered yeah so if we're like for my isp class we have to uh, our my specific project analyze how to expand um a hotel chain mm -hmm. so in that project how would i what, what mechanism should i use to value like, like a dcf or an npv Can you, you, let me ask you a question most of these classes when they ask you to do something they don't give you the information to kind of go very far what kind of information do you have on new hotels um, I have the line by line costs of the existing um, hotels, right? Oh, do you have the do you have, have, do you have projected numbers in the new hotels? Uh, no, no, I I, I didn't use, I, I didn't I had to make them up, but I don't trust my knowledge. So well, not it's that. not just that you can't trust your knowledge, but I you can make up numbers to make every new hotel a good hotel or a bad one. You know what you should base it on? Look at the return invested capital for hotels as a business. Right? Okay. Because if you're opening a new hotel, you can't, if the business fundamentally is a bad business, it's very difficult for you to argue that somehow you find a magic way of creating value. So when people present these hypothetical cases, sometimes all I have to do is look at the industry average. So when I see somebody saying, I've created this project where my automobile investments all deliver 30% returns, and I said, what world do you live in? The typical automobile company generates 4% returns in capital. So base it on what you see as industry averages and margins, returns in capital. And that's going to give you a platform at least for deciding whether expansion makes sense. I'll be quite honest. I think expansion in the hotel business is a horrifically bad idea. It's a hor given what I know about the business. But maybe your business is different. Maybe you're in a part of the world where there are opportunities. But I'm going to start off with the premise that knowing what I do about the business today, even pre-crisis, pre-COVID crisis, forget about post-crisis. Yeah, not pre-COVID, this pre is pre-COVID. Pre -co even pre-COVID, the returns on invested capital at the hotel business have been dropping for almost 20 years. Airbnb you know, was, it, was the latest disruption. But this has become a bad business. So if you're giving me an example of expansion, I'm gonna push you much harder than if you were growing in the software business. Okay, okay. Um, j j just to, to, to give you the approach that I use, I use a sales to capital ratio for EU hotels yeah. to project revenue. 
So that, that I didn't, I didn't yeah, want to say that. That's fine. So that at least you're using industry averages. What margins did you use? Uh, I use the margins of the old the hotel, the old. Okay. The, so at least your numbers old. numbers are based on something reasonable. You're not making up stuff. You're not making up crap out of nothing. So your investment should reflect what typically European hotels have to invest to get revenues. Your margins reflect what this company has made historically. Are you creating value? Do you put in a cost of constructing the hotels in there? Are you leasing the hotels? Yeah, yeah. So I estimated that line by line. Okay. Then do you, do you get did you, did you get a positive net present value? Yeah. Oh, I, I used ROIC. I didn't use MPV. Yeah. But that's fine. I did get a positive. I did get a positive MPV, but I got a 19% return on capital. And what is the industry average? Uh, I have to check that. I yeah, really that's know. what I would check because if it's seven, then I would be cautious. There's something in your numbers that probably is a little too optimistic. Because that sounds like it'd be great if it were true, right? If I could make 19% returns, but if the rest of the business is making seven, I've got to think about where my competitive advantage. Maybe this company has much higher margins than the rest of the sector. You want to isolate okay. what it is that's giving you that higher value. Okay, um, and then my second question is about pricing. Yeah. So I looked at your cover style of pricing, but I, I noticed that you use 606 companies in your comparables. I'm gonna have 70. That's um, fine. 70 is a big sample, 606 is, you know. I just used all steel companies, you know why? I just, you know, I, I let the law of large numbers and my regression take care of differences. So 70 is a huge sample. You're, you're fine. There are people using like eight, nine, ten companies. So. Okay. And then my second question was, should I account for um, net debt over EBITDA you know, as, uh, as a in my screens? Because low, higher debt companies typically. Why, have why don't you just leave the net debt and control for near aggression? Why do it in your screen? Oh, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Right. So that's always a choice. You can either build into your screens and end up with a smaller sample or leave it as a variable and control for the regression. I prefer to leave it as a variable and control in my regression. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, no, no question. Oh, sorry. Was there something? Uh, I must, um, I must you go first and Peter can go next, yeah. Uh, valuation for Saristol, the company? Yeah. I must keep going. The, the steel company, where can I find it? Because I looked through the using on markets, your blog. No, 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 no. Go, to the, go to the web. The email? Yeah, go to, no, go to the webcast page for this class. That's where everything oh, for this okay. class is there. So it was week and a half ago. It's a valuation of the week. Remember on Tuesdays I used to send a valuation of the week. It's unfortunate because when online I've kind of not been it. Yeah. Yeah. So go back. It was the valuation of the week two weeks ago. So the webcast page. Okay. Yeah, and if I, you can't... Yeah, I think I missed it. If you, it's okay, you know, because I, I send you so much crap. I, I don't blame you for missing it. So it was also sent as an email from that week on a Tuesday. But if you can't find it, let me know and I'll send you the link again. Okay, thank you. Peter? Hi, Professor, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, when I sent you my DCF, you said that the uh, long-term growth rate was unrealistic, but I'm having trouble interpreting in terms of the cannabis, when we're looking at the cannabis market in the US. They no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Which law, are you talking about the perpetual growth rate? Uh, a long-term growth rate. So when you, when you say long, when you say long-term, what, what exactly are you talking about? Are you talking about the growth rate after year 10 or the growth rate for the next 10 years? Growth rate after year ten. Well, that's for the, that kind of both. So, uh, cannabis is projected to hit hundred billion in sales by twenty thirty, and this year did about eleven billion. So we're seeing yeah. long term, like pretty. So what? Did, so let me let me focus in on your company. What are you giving your? This is both medicinal and recreational. Yes. And what company so you do? So the compounded annual growth rate over the past four years has been two hundred and eighteen percent, or two hundred and yeah, roughly two hundred seventy. Well, because you went from nothing. So that that's absolutely meaningless. You went from a business that was not even a business to a business. That, so don't even look at that past growth rate. It doesn't mean much. Let's take the 100 billion as the market. How much are you giving okay. as revenues for your company in year 10? Do you remember? Uh, year 10, I mean, at this current model, which I don't entirely yeah. think, like I'm trying to fix this, is at 11 billion. Okay, um, so, so you're giving the them a... Forecasting, sorry? You're, so you're giving them about 11% market share, right? 
Yeah. What, what is uh, uh, the company's forecasting for next year about uh, what Steve was forecasting about 800 million from 221 uh, million this past past year. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to interpret it because you know the, the, the industry is growing for the next 10 years. So, so let's let's set let's set that first half. Let's accept that the industry is growing. More people are going to switch to legal marijuana because remember. Some of it is switching. It's not that people who never smoked cannabis are going to smoke it now. It's that they used to get it from their dealer illegally on the boardwalk, and now they're going to buy it from a store. In fact, one of the first challenges the legal cannabis business is going through is a lot of people are still preferring. So in Colorado, you know, I live in San Diego, you can legally buy cannabis, but I think most people still buy it from their dealer because it's much cheaper. So assuming yeah. that legal businesses take over and that 100 billion becomes almost entirely like a tobacco business, tell me why you think your company is one, going to be one of the bigger players. Because you're giving them 11% market share of this market. What is it that sets them apart? Well, currently they're the, uh, the best, you know, they have one of the strongest balance sheets in the industry. They have one of the most built out uh, retail, actually the biggest retail presence in the industry right okay. now. They have the largest revenue in the industry in okay. the U.S. Um, and also they have, you know, just have done some serious, like large acquisitions. Uh, so you know, that's what you need to build into your story is when you give me the 11 billion, don't just state it as a growth rate. So, it's because, so the market size is only a small piece of your end story. That's part of the story. But the other part is that you see your company as one of the winners in this game and you need to kind of lay the foundations for what? So you want, so the eleven billion. So I can see the eleven billion to you. So what's your growth rate after your ten? Uh, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you think this will behave more like a alcohol or tobacco industry? How do you think? This no, but remember, after your ten, this has nothing to do with your business. This is forever. And what do we put as a cap rate? Yeah. A cap on the growth rate forever. So I mean, roughly the same as like uh, I don't know, population growth or or the economy, rate. right? So basically, if you, this is nothing to do with cannabis anymore. This is to do with what will a mature company grow at. So the reason I, if, so if you used to grow trade much higher than your risk free rate, which is what you probably did, I said, this can't happen yeah. because mathematically the company will blow up. It'll become the economy. So that growth rate after year 10 has nothing to do with cannabis or how big the market is. It's growth rate forever. So it's got to be constrained to being very close or below the risk free rate. Okay, and uh, can I ask one more question sure. in terms of uh, taxes? So cannabis companies have to pay uh, taxes according to 280E tax code, mm -hmm. which basically say the companies that are selling a product that's on the Controlled Substance Act cannot deduct any expenses from gross income. So how do I incorporate that into the model, like, uh, you know, more precisely? I know that there's been mixed- What's the definition? Uh, what, what are they allowed to subtract out to get from revenues to gross income? Uh, I think they can subtract that cost of goods sold, and that's about it. Okay. Uh, I know that they can't so, any SG&A expenses or anything like that. I know some companies uh, incorporate uh, some SG&A into their cost of goods sold, and or they figure out you know ways of doing that in accounting. And I know that the uh, IRS hasn't been too strict on. You know why that? You know why that is? Because right now you're in a window that is a very very strange window, which is cannabis is legal in states, but it's still illegal at the federal level. So what yeah. you're capturing is that is that disconnect. The minute cannabis becomes legal at the federal level, that tax that tax problem will go away, because in a sense, this is the federal government punishing states for saying, "How dare you legalize something that we think is illegal?" So I would make too much of that tax difference. You could try to build your spreadsheet, but you don't want to build it in for the long term because this is definitely going to disappear as these companies mature and become more conventional companies. Right. So I wouldn't worry so, too much about the tax. I just treat it like any other company. You know, take the taxes and okay, the tax. So don't include that in at the moment because yeah. expecting legalization. So. Because that, okay. you know, that, that has to be part of your story because if that doesn't happen, your entire story falls apart. Yeah. There's no way you can become a $100 billion legal market if the federal government doesn't make it legal. Yeah, yeah. gotcha. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Laura? Hey, how are hey, you? Good. I think my sample is too big. You can never have a sample that's too big. No, but I'm like, I think I'm being a little bit ridiculous. So I'm oh. doing Lyft. I know we talked about this. Right. So what did you use as your sample? It's 
there's like 70 something companies no more like 100 something and i also put a bunch of different technology companies Mm -hmm. thinking that that also is one of i because no, it's no, I'll be quite honest. I think you're on the right track because when I when I talk to investors who invest in Lyft, they talk about Lyft in the same breath that they talk about, uh, you know, Cisco or you know, Facebook. Basically, they think nobody when I talk right. about them, Lyft talks about UPS as the comparison, right? It's always against tech companies. Yeah. So I think that using the tech companies is not the problem. But let me guess what your problem is. You take that large sample, you run a regression, you put it on Lyft, and the number you're getting... Can I show you my screen? I'm sorry? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm just going to show it to you because some of these companies, I don't really know them. Oh. I can't do it while someone else is doing it. Sorry. Oh, you can't. Why don't you just email me the spreadsheet? I'll take a look at it and okay. tell you whether, whether, whether I... You know, whether you need to fix it or yeah. this is, you know, sometimes you can't fight the data. The re- none of the regressions will work and you have to say it is what it is and move on. And Lyft and Uber might be a, the two companies where you might just have to throw up your hands at the end and say, I can't explain the pricing. These companies are kind of yeah. priced against <laughs> each other. And you know what? That might be what's happening in the market is Lyft is priced against Uber and Uber is priced against Lyft and the two are kind of locked at the hip as right. they ride up and down into the sunset. But uh, send me the spreadsheet and I'll definitely take a look at it. Okay, cool. I'll export it and send it to you as an email. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, folks? Uh, Peter, I will get that spreadsheet back to you. I just saw your email. And Jonathan, I haven't looked at Visa's acquisition of Play, but given that Visa is a huge company, Play is a small company, this might, it might actually make sense because you're acquiring a technology, it's really not a company. So I'll take a look at that as well. Cole says Lyft is up 16% after hours. So uh, that's you know, something to keep in mind. It must have come out of the earnings announcement. But that's pretty much it. And I will put the links to the final exam today, right after the class is over. But uh, Max, you have, a fi- you have a final question? Uh, yeah. So I told my team I'm going to be submitting individually, but yeah. should I also let the TAs or no, or you know no, that? No, right? so no, that. There's nothing else you need to do. So just send it in. Okay. Say, no. Okay. Uh, so for submitting, we send it to your email at the final uh, okay. with the list, like my list. My list. Exactly. And make sure okay. you put that subject in the end. What is it? What is it? The okay. end okay. Is whatever. Also it's all right. End number, uh, also put the end number into that spreadsheet you can. Yeah, just please input those numbers as soon as you can. Don't wait too long because I need those numbers by Sunday. The project itself is not due to 5 p.m. on Monday, but the numbers themselves I prefer to get into the spreadsheet earlier than that. Okay, I got it. And also, do you still have office hours? I will have office hours tomorrow and day after. Check your email from Monday because I listed the, the links for the Thursday and Friday office hours. Okay, thank you. Okay. That's it, folks. I am going to end for the day, and uh, I will talk to you Monday for the last session. But as I said, we keep the numbers rolling in, and uh, talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.